Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our event on unlocking investment through climate advisory uh, through the European Investment Advisory Hub. We're delighted that so many of you who have registered and joined us this afternoon and um, look forward to introducing our speakers very shortly. We have four presentations for you. Um, the idea behind our session really is to give you all a flavour for the nature and the type of advice and support that you can get from the advisory hub. And we thought the best way to do that would be to, first of all, give you an introduction to the, 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 the scope, the breadth of support. I'll start by introducing some of the, the basics of the hub. And then my colleague Alina Tassana from the uh, European Commission will go through that in more detail and also give us a bit more of a future perspective in terms of how the advisory hub might develop to the next MFF in the future. And then we'll pass uh, to colleagues who will present some examples of projects which have received support from the advisory hub, again with a view to giving you a flavour of the types of support that are available and hopefully to inspire you and encourage you to, uh, to seek advisory hub support in the future for your projects and programmes and investment platforms. We have, if you've been in one of the earlier sessions or this is your first session, uh, we have Slido up and running so you can ask questions of our panellists through Slido. Um, so hopefully you're familiar with that tool. Uh, you can also vote on the question. So if you see that another participant has asked a question which you think is particularly interesting, please like that. And then that will give us an indication that they are the questions that we should try and filter through and, and, and put to the, the panellists. So hopefully that's OK to start us off. Um, I will then could have the next slide, please. Just talk us through a little bit about the advisory hub, just to give you a brief introduction. So the advisory hub was developed and uh, introduced as part of the investment plan for Europe. The idea being that there really was a need to facilitate access to advisory support across the EU and to provide a single access point so that uh, project promoters, public authorities could go to one place and find all of the support that they needed. There was also a need to really facilitate how public authorities, in particular national promotional banks, shared their expertise, uh, shared lessons learned, best practices and so on, and to build really a, a, a sound cooperation platform to help, help projects and programmes and platforms. So that's the basic concept behind the hub to be a, a one-stop shop, as it were, and a single entry point to help public authorities, private sector project promoters access advisory support. Next slide, please. So these are the areas in which the advisory hub can provide support. We've grouped them into, into four key areas. So the first one is about trying to support the development of, of project pipelines. So really trying to provide technical assistance and support to help improve the quality and, and quantity of projects which are investment ready. And types of support that can be provided include things like feasibility studies, business planning support, financial modelling, structuring, to really help bring projects from a conceptual point, from an idea point, to a stage at which they're capable of, of, of uh, supporting investment and, and receiving investment decisions. We also do a lot in relation to market development. And um, so a good example of that is um, the work that we did in relation to developing energy performance contracting and developing a Eurostat guide and doing some awareness raising around that to really help encourage public authorities to look for solutions around off-balance sheet financing. Other areas which are equally important, particularly in, in the climate space, are in investment platforms and aggregation mechanisms where there are often, as, as you will know, um, portfolios of, of very small projects which are too, too small sometimes in, in their own right to secure financing on, on the right terms, so they need structures which can allow them to be aggregated up to give them more critical mass and, and through through that area of support we can provide um, gap assessments and help on investment strategies and fund manager procurement and so on and then finally there's a, a stronger work around financial intermediary capacity building national promotional bank capacity building where we're looking to help NPBs develop their own local advisory capacity recognizing that and the EIB is, a, is an international financial institution and it's, it's not always the best place to deliver advisory at a more local level. And to help financial intermediaries also develop tools which are embedded in their instruments. So um, we're looking at, in particular, trying to introduce new concepts such as web tools, which are embedded in financial instruments and investment platforms to help facilitate 
and, and mobilise investment. So I just wanted to give you a brief a brief introduction to the advisory hub so you, you understood a little bit about what it was there to do and, and some of the, the activity that, that it can support you with. I will now pass the floor to Alina Tanatha from, from DG ECFIN. So Alina is the Deputy Head of Unit um, for Infrastructure and Climate Change Finance. So we have the pleasure of working with Alina on, uh, on all things advisory hub and, and InvestEU. So I'll pause there and, and pass the floor to Alina. Welcome, Alina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I hope you can all hear me well. Um, I'm very glad to be invited and take part to this session, underlying the role of the advisory for unlocking investment, uh, supporting the green recovery. So as Emily mentioned, I'll focus uh, the, my presentation on the current European Investment Advisory Hub, or the AIA, and the future InvestU Advisory Hub that will be part of the Invest, uh, InvestU program. Next slide, please. So Emily presented earlier the key role of the hub in supporting sustainable growth by developing a pipeline of investment projects. Um, you all know in the Commission we will, and especially in the Financial and Economic Directorate, the GECFIN uh, that I belong to, we like numbers. So I tried on this slide to, to present uh, some uh, key figures related to the hub. Since its launch in September 2015, the hub has received more than 1,700 uh, requests, which translates uh, into more or less one request per day, with about 60% coming from the private sector. 500 of these requests have received or are currently receiving uh, detailed advisory support, and 25% of them, roughly 100 uh, requests, have a climate dimension. In conclusion, based on the support that the AI has uh, directly provided, uh, all, uh, all has provided, almost 10 billion euros of climate-related investment has been mobilized, either via direct hub support or thanks to the synergies developed with the LNA advisory services that you will probably hear a little bit more about later on. Uh, all these 500 hub assignments are covering the entire project life cycle, while also uh, the hub can provide capacity building support if needed. So if we move to the next slide, uh, here I, uh, we have a couple of examples uh, relevant for uh, today's uh, session on unlocking investment through climate advisory. The first one has already been mentioned by um, uh, Emily, it's the guide on the statistical treatment of EPC that was prepared by EIB experts with the hub uh, support. In the second example, the clean buses in Bulgaria, the hub advice is helping uh, the city of Sofia deciding on options to fund and finance an investment program for new electric or alternate fuel buses that uh, are part of the uh, renewal of the city's bus fleet. Um, the hub is also supporting the transition to the circular econo economy through these uh, smart inve uh, infrastructure investments in Thessaloniki. The hub is uh, currently supporting the city develop a more efficient waste collect uh, collection system for the city to make Thessaloniki, Thessaloniki a circular uh, city. Finally, the hub is also supporting the street lightning company of Vilnius uh, to develop a financial model for an ambitious pro project aiming to install um, LED bulbs in over 40,000 lamps in the, in the capital city. So the project has uh, also received uh, almost 22 billion, millions of euros in FC back loan and will help reduce electri electricity consumption by half and this will more or less save about 1 million euros a year. If we move to the next slide, um, a few words about our plans for the future. So the InvestEU uh, Advisory Hub will be part of the bigger program, the InvestEU, which is the Commission's proposed uh, flex flagship investment program to kickstart the European economy and to support the EU policies in the recovery from this current uh, economic and social crisis. So the InvestEU is, as you can see on the slide, is based on three mutually reinforcing pillars. The fund, the InvestEU fund providing the EU financing, uh, the EU guarantee to support financing. The InvestEU advisory hub providing tailored advisory support for project development. And last but not least, the, the InvestEU portal, uh, the, which is an online database for promoting the 
EU-based investments to the EU-based projects in, in search for financing. So the fund uh, we see here will integrate is a multi-policy instrument that will uh, be integrating uh, 13 of the current financial instruments uh, existing, as well as the FC, the European Fund for Strategic Investments, with a, a budgetary guarantee of uh, 75 billion. It is expected to mobilize up to 1 trillion of additional investments across Europe, and uh, out of which 30% should contribute to climate objectives. The investor will support actually more or less all EU policy areas through the five policy windows, um, as illustrated at the bottom of the slide. So we have the sustainable infrastructure window, research, innovation and digitalization window, the SMEs, the social investment and skills, and last but not least, the, what uh, was added in the recent proposal, the strategic European investment window. And uh, if we move to the last slide now, as in the case of the InvestEU fund, the InvestEU advisory hub will also integrate the current AIA, the, the current hub, and 12 other existing uh, EU-level technical assistance uh, initiatives, such as the ELENA program that I mentioned earlier. It will be provided, the advisory uh, will be provided in the InvestEU program policy areas, using the same structure that I mentioned earlier with the five policy windows. And the advisory will also promote the sectoral and geographical diversification of the investeu. As mentioned in the recent um, Commission recovery package, the enhanced investeu program will actually ensure a strong focus on the of the investors on the EU medium and long term uh, policy priorities such as the European Green Deal, the digital digitalization transition, and greater resilience. Um, as for the InvestEU program, we'll have the same clear target for climate action, 30% of the uh, hub uh, will be uh, supporting climate objectives. And therefore, the hub is also expected to contribute to large initiatives that are currently being developed to support the clean energy priorities, such as the renovation wave initiative or the offshore wind strategy. All these projects could benefit from the advisory hub support and make use of the opportunities provided. Last but not least, the enhanced InvestEU program also includes an increased budget for the InvestEU advisory hub, which now amounts to seven, 700 million over the next seven years. With this uh, budget, we are confident that the, the, the advisory hub will continue to be able to support the development of a robust pipeline of investment projects in Europe in all key EU policy priorities, and in particular for climate action. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, I have a couple of questions for you, Alina, if you don't mind. But before I ask you those, I would just like to remind everybody that we have launched the first poll on Slido. So if you haven't yet had a look at, at Slido and, and voted, please do. Um, the question is around, have you heard of the advisory hub before? And currently, no is no is leading. So uh, if you haven't answered, please, please do please vote. So Alina, thanks very much for your your presentation. Um, so I think in the in the next MFF under InvestEU Advisory Hub, you're introducing now the notion of advisory partners. So could you perhaps say a little bit more about how you will implement the future advisory hub and and how if somebody is interested in becoming an advisory partner, they they could perhaps uh, pursue that. Yes, of course. So um, in the in the next MFF, the Investor Advisory Hub will be, as, you, as Emily mentioned, you mentioned, will have advisory partners. One of them will be, of course, uh, the EAB, which will continue to be our privileged partner, uh, as it is uh, expected to implement 75% of the of both the EU guarantee and also of the Investor Advisory Hub envelope. The remaining 25%, so 175 million out of the 700 million I, I mentioned earlier, will be available for advisory partners other than the EAB. So this includes international financial institutions, but also national promotional banks and, other, and institutions. So this uh, 175 million will be allocated uh, via call for, for uh, proposals uh, that we are planning to, to publish later this year after the MFF is, is agreed. So institutions that are uh, willing to become advisory partners will need to respond to the call. 
uh, to this call. But there is also the possibility to, to continue to implement advisory initiatives indirectly by signing uh, agreements with DAB as, currently, it's, as it's currently done under the AIA through the, the call for proposals for MPBs. Thank you. And, and another question, if, if I may, so we know that the, the, uh, the recovery package was announced two or three weeks ago and a number of new instruments were, were put forward. Do you see uh, an expanded role for the advisory hub in, in its current form w with these new instruments as part of the recovery package? Yes, actually, in the recovery package, we had the, an enhanced investing fund, we had the, the RRF, but we also have what we call the, uh, the solvency support instrument, which the SSI, which is to be deployed uh, quickly as a separate window under the current FC, so the European Fund for Strategic Investments. So part of this proposal, the Commission has also proposed an increase of the technical assistance envelope, by 100 million euros. So this 100 million euros will uh, be available to support the implementation of the SSI, the Solvency Support Instrument. Then this uh, amount can be used either for setting up new financial structures, uh, such as equity funds, SPVs, or investment platforms needed for uh, implementing the new instrument, or also for providing advisory support uh, not to, for the green and digital transformation of companies financed under the FCSSI window. Okay, thank you. And, and my final question for you, so we understand that the, the EU would like to double the renovation um, rate as part of the recovery plan, and we understand uh, a major new initiative known as the renovation wave will, will be the flagship of that, of that plan. On a practical basis, what, what role do you see the advisory hub, um, how do you see the advisory hub contributing to, to the renovation wave as we move forwards? Yes, as we've seen earlier, we the InvestEU uh, such has an overall target of 30% for supporting climate action and probably the renovation wave will be uh, part of it. Uh, the Investio Advisory Hub already foresees stronger links between the advisory support uh, and the Investio fund project pipeline. So this reinforced uh, program uh, the, and the, also the reinforced InvestEU uh, actually doubled the size of the sustainable infrastructure window, which has now 40 billion of euros. Uh, no, 20 billion, sorry, to contribute. Uh, and this means that they, they, they will be able to contribute more to the Green Deal objectives, including the sizable energy investment, uh, energy efficiency investment needs. Furthermore, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the LNI initiative will be continued after 2020 under the InvestEU Advisory Hub. And uh, just uh, for uh, your information, we are already working with our colleagues, uh, DG NR and other commission services to make sure that uh, all the e relevant EU budget and this next generation EU programs are in place to, to successfully contribute to all these uh, objectives. Great, thank you, Alina. And if the audience have any questions for Alina, please feel free to put those on, on Slido. We will collect those um, and then we will take them after our next speaker, which brings me perfectly to our next speaker. So I'd like to now introduce Martin Poloni to, to present to us. Martin is Director General of the International Relations Department of the Ministry of Finance in Slovakia, and we've worked with Martin on the design and development of financial instruments and also energy performance contracting. So I think Martin has got a very good example of, of how the hub can, can provide support on a, on, a, on a very practical way. So Martin, I, I pass the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, yes, uh, I'm a Director General of International Relations Section, which uh, doesn't really click with the energy efficiency. But uh, what we do is actually that a large uh, part of my section is dedicated to financial instruments and uh, international financial institutions. That's why uh, we do have experience in, in this area. Uh, so if I may, the next slide, please. Uh, uh, also, it is not like the, the main agenda of uh, uh, the ministries of finance to promote uh, anything which uh, uh, well, to focus on energy efficiency or energy performance contracts. 
but our like long term idea is an endeavor is uh, to crowd in private uh, investment private finance uh, to support the uh, public policy uh, objectives and one of those areas where uh, uh, that there was an obvious case uh, for uh, more effort uh, were the energy performance contracts. Uh, so uh, I will not go into detail on what the energy performance contracts are, uh, but they basically allow us to, to uh, invest funds in a sort of a PPP type of project uh, invest funds into public buildings without actually impacting immediately the the public finance. That's why it's quite appealing to to the minister um, to the Ministry of Finance. So uh, what we did was that uh, whenever uh, the energy performance contracts were stabilized in terms of regulation and opinions from Eurostat, uh, we launched. Uh, uh, our own homework in Slovakia, uh, prepared uh, enabling uh, legislation and uh, uh, a template uh, temp template documentation for uh, for the use of uh, uh, every owner or manager of public building. So that it's uh, a, so that it's, it 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 is approved at the at the country level. And anyone who wants to use it uh, can just use the, the, the template contract. And uh, in the end, he's actually obliged also to, to use this type of contract because all the little details uh, which uh, uh, wait on uh, whether the energy performance contracts and ends up on or off government balance sheet must be must be well reflected in the contract. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so well, what happens is uh, in these two slides, there are some basic uh, information on uh, uh, how the contract is actually structured in order uh, in order for the energy performance contract uh, to not count into into public sector actually to to be of government balance sheet. I will not go into detail, so please, uh, next slide. And the next slide. Yeah. So uh, we, we have actually successfully launched this initiative in Slovakia last year, uh, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not obvious. The, the, the take up of the project is, is not really obvious. Uh, there are several reasons for that. So, so when we look, when we apply all the details which are required for energy performance contracts, uh, uh, like we have found out that uh, not so many things can actually be uh, counted. Uh, well, 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 the the mathematics or the economy of the projects is uh, is not always working. So, uh, for most of the for many buildings, it, it just doesn't it doesn't work by itself. Uh, so, so th this is this is the first lesson. The second would be that the uh, usually the investment required in a building is uh, too large compared to the savings that it can actually generate, uh, which then means that the, the the payback period of of the whole contract is too long. Uh, which brings a whole uh, new set of issues. Uh, and it's not so attractive then for private investors. So uh, the, like the drawbacks of the, of the I would say, uh, regulation, uh, which is then introduced in a, in a, in a guide or, uh, or it, is, it is booked it is it is written in in a guide which is jointly uh, issued by uh, the Eurostat and the European Investment Bank. Uh, that, for instance, we can't count in uh, the the savings, the the operational savings. So, if there is an investment in a building which leads to uh, the building actually 
save on operational costs such as uh, staff uh, running a boiler or uh, something similar. Uh, uh, th this is not possible to be counted as uh, energy efficiency saving. So that, that's one of the drawbacks. Uh, <clears throat> and the other drawback is that uh, it would be nice to be able uh, to actually combine uh, everything which, is, which generates uh, savings uh, with, the, with something, with grants actually. And the combination uh, proved to be a bit uh, challenging. So, uh, but it is, a, it is all, uh, we, we find it as a major achievement actually that we managed to put together a contract which makes sense it does work, uh, and it is also approved by the Eurostat to be a uh, fully fledged of balance sheet energy performance contract uh, uh, temp uh, template contract. So, uh, so that's uh, from my side uh, for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Martin, for that. It was very useful and interesting. So I, I have a couple of questions for you, if I may. The, the first one really is if you could explain to us how the advisory hub helped you in developing the Maastricht neutral uh, model contract in, in Slovakia. So, so, so yes, uh, sorry, I, I failed to uh, underline the, the important role of the advisory hub, which, which was really important because uh, very closely uh, uh, in touch on on the on the contract itself which has uh, more than uh, it has approximately 50 pages so it's not a light contract because it's a uh, it uh, defines uh, a period uh, of uh, relationship between the energy savings uh, or energy service company and the, the the owner or the manager of the public building for some 15 years uh, so, so it, it's not a light contract. It needs to reflect everything which is in the in the guide, which was issued uh, by the Eurostat uh, together with the EIB. And the benefit, actually, uh, to work closely with, with the hub, was that uh, we were able to actually uh, get uh, involved uh, the people who are actually. Uh, preparing the guide together with the Eurostat, which was which was actually a, a tremendous help. And whenever we had a problem with the uh, interpretation of uh, of some of the little details, uh, we were able to uh, to write it in a way which is acceptable by Eurostat. So uh, uh, yeah, it was very helpful. Great. And what would you say, you mentioned lessons learned in relation to, to EPC, but what would you say would be your key recommendations for other countries who are looking to really increase their, their renovation rate via EPC? So one of the most precious uh, uh, things uh, for, uh, on the, for the energy performance contracts are actually the EU funds which are uh, by definition statistically neutral uh, and do not influence whether the contract actually ends up on government balance sheet or off government balance sheet. So uh, this actually is the main possibility how you can make the energy performance contracts more attractive uh, by combining an investment grant with, uh, with future savings you can make much more of a uh, investment uh, or the capex on the building can actually be much bigger. So uh, this, this then makes uh, much more sense. Great, thank you. So we have um, some Slido polls now. Um, before we go to poll two, um, the results of poll one were that 64% of you haven't actually heard of the advisory hub before before today so we definitely need to do more in terms of our communication and marketing to to improve that for for the future um, but the next poll um should be in front of your screens now and um, so we'd like to understand participants views um, in terms of where do you see the most need for advisory support in, in the climate action sector 
So do you see it very upstream? So formulating policy, helping develop investment programs. Do you see it more at, at project level in terms of financial advisory, helping with structuring, helping design energy performance contracts, PPPs? Um, do you see it uh, technical advisory? So really doing you know, more traditional project preparation work, feasibility work, uh, cost benefit analysis and so on. So the, um, the scores are coming in. So it looks like we've got a clear winner. Being technical advisory. Yeah, great. Oh, financial advisory is giving it a run for its money. Okay, and obviously, all all three of those different components are are essential and, and needed if we're to mobilise investment in this sector. Great. Okay, so we'll keep going because we've got to be conscious of, of time. Um. So, Alina, Martin, do you want to reflect on, on those Slido results at all? Are they in line with what you would have expected? Alina, does it surprise you, first of all, that, that so many people hadn't heard of the advisory hub in, in poll one and, and Martin in relation to poll two? Does that confirm your, your experience in terms of where is advisory most needed? So, Alina, could you perhaps reflect? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, on the I'll start with the last one. Uh, I like the one when everything was equal because, in our view, uh, we see a role for the the advisory hub in over the whole project life cycle. So, from the very upstream uh, support until the, actually even the project implementation uh, role, because uh, that uh, we, we get all kind of uh, requests like this. But um, as I said, in the on the future, in, let's say, invest EU advisory hub, we also foresee a bigger role for the for the advisory hub to support the pipeline of the invest EU fund. So the forty six percent is actually showing that. Good. Great, thank you, Martin. Any reflections? Yes, uh, for me, the traditional role actually was the the least favored in the in the polls, the upstream advisory policy level program programming level that that was what i saw as a, as the uh, the traditional role of the advisory but uh like over the time uh, uh like we saw that like uh the hub could actually be more and more useful in actually providing the the technical advisor advisory and the financial advisory uh, uh, in a sort of a more of a hands-on approach, uh, w w which is a natural development, and uh, it, it is now perfectly in line with uh, what, what I would expect. Great, thank you. So now my colleague Robert should hopefully have had a look at the questions that had been put through on onto Slido, and um, they should appear. Great. It works. So, um, should we take them from the top? So, number one, investment needs for the Green Deal are massive. Is there sufficient advisory budget available? So, maybe that's a question for Alina. Sorry, Alina. That's okay. So, um, as I said, we do have uh, an increase in the advisory envelope under the Investor Advisory Hub which is now uh, about 700 euro, uh, million euros. But this is not all supporting the renovation wave, for example. It is, as I said, our target is 30% of this should su support the, the climate action. So probably there is a need for other um, other programs EU at EU level, but also at national level to, to be able to, to reach this very ambitious uh, target. Great. Yep. I'm just looking at the question. Sorry, as, I, as I'm listening to you. Uh, the next question, to what extent does the advisory hub take the taxonomy in sustainable finance? Guess into account is, is, is missing from the question. Is that something you could... I, and what I can develop on this, but it's not necessarily... Uh, so let's say the advisory hub is 
and uh, the current advisory hub is actually supporting the the development of the what we call this uh, the um, uh, sustainability proofing that it will be mandatory for all projects under the investeu fund but this is not uh, the case for the advisory as such so we do have a role in terms of uh, supporting uh, the uh, and setting up the guidance and also developing the capacity of the financial uh, intermediaries and financial institutions in being able to implement this uh, the taxonomy and especially in the, in the for the investeu the sustainability proofing requirements thank you um another question which has been voted to the top so what will be done with the recent AI review of the european court of auditors to achieve its full potential to boost investments post 2020 eg for renovations um very sorry Lena, but i think that one's for you as well yeah that's fine you keep shooting <laughs> Uh, so we have, uh, as you know, we have accepted all the recommendations, so the, the Commission together with EAB, all the recommendations that uh, the ECA had uh, pro uh, given us for uh, improvements both for the AIA, so the current hub, and also the InvestEU. Uh, with the, on the AI, we are working with our uh, EAB colleagues to, to implement them because the deadline is quite short. But in terms of InvestEU, we will, uh, of course, try to, uh, and we, we will link it closer to the InvestEU fund. We have to uh, clearly make a link to the investment, uh, as, as they said. And in terms of, reno um, is it uh, the, in terms of uh, the renovation wave, Again, we have a 30% target for advisory. This is what the regulation is saying. Now, if we can do more or uh, of this, we will. But uh, I would not commit to to, to more now because we have, uh, besides the the climate and the, the energy efficiency objectives, we have uh, quite a few of other EU policy priorities to to follow up and to support through the advisory hub. Yeah, and, and there's a balancing act to achieve, isn't there, in terms of upstream market development work, which we know is needed, and also uh, the more traditional project pipeline work. Um, so this is a very good question. How can the advisory hub support local one-stop shops at city or regional level? Um, Louise, you've not had the chance to present yet, but is that a question that you might want to um, to jump in on? Because that's something I know you're you're keen to encourage through Eleanor and maybe give Alina a little break from answering questions. <laughs> we can't hear you, sorry Louise. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yes, I mean, in a few minutes, um, we'll be discussing um, one of the uh, banks advisory programs, which is Elena. Um, and for those who don't know Elena, it's essentially a program run with the European Commission, between the European Commission and the, and the European Investment Bank, and it provides grants um, to prepare projects. And there are um, some one-stop shops which are currently benefiting from um, an Elena grant. Um, both with and without uh, EIB financing to actually um, implement the, the investments on the ground. And um, it's definitely something that um, both the Commission and the bank is keen to support, uh, particularly for the residential sector, because what we see working on the ground is when people have this local connection. You know, you can go to, to a local office, you know the local contractors, and you can get... Um, the, you have those local networks and those local relationships, which I think when you're talking about people's homes is, is, is definitely something that, 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 that is important. And um, as part of the renovation wave or whatever we want to call it, I mean, we, we all agree that over the next decade, we have to see a huge increase in the number of buildings that are being renovated. And hopefully the residential sector will be a large part of that. So. I think that in that for that se sector in particularly, the the one stop shop is something that um, that is definitely um, a structure that we're keen to support, and it's also mentioned in the Europe in the EIB's energy lending policy as a structure that 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 is um, that, that that we want to develop. So, I mean, the advisory hub you know overlaps all of those types of things because there's going to be different levels of advice 
needed at different um, parts of that. Great, thank you, Louise. Thanks for jumping in. And, and Martin, maybe, um, maybe I can add in a little bit on this uh, on the Zagasti Invest EU advisory hub. As I said, we'll have several advisory partners, including national promotional banks and institutions. So this uh, is one of the the reasons why we uh, we extended the the let's say the implementation to other partners to make sure that we manage to to uh, reach out to the local uh, and to provide this advice as locally as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to ask Martin. So the um, the question at the top of my screen, at least, so is there room for EIB and the Invest EU advisory hub to proactively? go to the national and regional level to build project pipelines and that that builds on this concept to think of, of one-stop shops is that something martin that you think would add real value in in, in slovakia is that something you see uh of being a, of value moving forwards uh, i think it, it is of value uh because uh if if i may like uh, broader the, the context of this discussion so what happens now in Slovakia is that uh, we have uh, we are a cohesion country, and there is a, a large chunk of money that we still to need to invest uh, from the from the cohesion funds until 2023. It's uh, uh, Slovakia is a five million inhabitants country. Then we also have uh, the, the the new programming period. Uh, which is a very, very similar uh, amount of money, which needs to start getting implemented uh, from next year. And then uh, uh, there is a, a quite a quite considerable allocation uh, from the resilience and recovery facility. At, at the same time, there is just transition mechanism. So uh, there is an overlap of several programs uh, shared uh, uh, under shared management uh, implemented locally uh, in Slovakia and it, it is all more or less grant money so most of the project management uh, capacity in Slovakia will be focused on actually using uh, these funds and uh, whatever is uh, more sophisticated and could actually leverage uh, also at local level uh, the, the, the capacities at local level uh, uh, would be very much welcome, uh, and uh, that, that's where the uh, the advisory hub could uh, indeed help. Uh, I assume. Great, thank you, Martin, for those those reflections. Um, this is quite a, a funny question. So, aren't there too many advisory services provided by the Commission? Do we need some advisory service? To help us navigate basically the advisory tools and, and initiatives that are that are available. Um, Alina, I think that's one perhaps your best best place to try and answer it today. This is a very good question. I'm uh, and I'm personally not sure if there are too many or too few advisory programs currently offered or supported by the EU, as the role of the advisory is um, widely recognised and always in high demand. Now. However, as we have seen through through these lessons learned in the, the current MFF and through the, in the, our proposal regarding the merging of all the 12 existing advisory initiatives and the AI into the Investor Advisory Hub, we'll try to avoid, at least in the next MFF, any overlaps or, or, or between initiatives or create gaps. Uh, while at the same time trying to provide targeted advisory services to support uh, the EU priorities. So, I, what is if, very important, it was... Uh, yes, sorry, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, I just wanted uh, to add something when it, whenever you're finished from the user per perspective. Okay, the, I just wanted to, to mention the fact that now we have the single entry point through the AIA. We'll continue it, of course, under the Investor Advisory Hub. Uh, with, we'll just change between, uh, we switch between the AB and the Commission. And like this, we'll be able to centralize all the requests and allocate them through the most uh, suitable advisory initiative or advisory partner. Okay, thank you. Martin. Martin, did you come in? Yes, uh, so 
So from my my point of view as a as a, as, as the user or, or the one who uh, asks uh, for uh, help from the ad, for advisory help, I, I usually don't don't really even know like which uh, advisory body is helping, but it's perfectly somehow it's perfectly working uh, that uh, like for every specific topic it ends up in in the in the specific uh, advisory pot, let's say. So uh, I, I, I don't see a problem there. Okay, but maybe maybe that does link to the, the communication point that we, uh, we polled on earlier, that you may not know you're even receiving advisory hub support. And so it's something uh, something we need, to, we need to pick up on as you move forward. Um, so last question, or back to you, Alina, I think, for this one. So do you have a plan uh, to have different types of advisory support allocated to the different investor U windows? different criteria and what will be the, the main differences with the existing European investment advisory hub? Yes, so as I said, the Investio Advisory Hub will actually follow the same structure as the Investio Funds, so we'll have uh, five windows. I mentioned them earlier, sust from sustainable infrastructure up to the new one, the strategic investment, uh, European investment window. And for uh, each of them, we'll have uh, normally advisory initiatives targeted to support the policy priorities of these windows. Of, on top of them, we have what we call a cross-sectoral component, we, where we will have, uh, we will be able to cover, let's say, the more horizontal requests for advisory support. Now, I don't see that there was a second question in the, in, the, in the poll, but I don't see it anymore. What's the difference with the AIA? So the, yeah. what the AIA is doing right now is uh, more or less going to be continued under the Investio Advisory Hub. So we'll continue to have the central entry point that the AI is currently doing very well right now, as Martin mentioned, it seems that it works. So we will continue it. And the, the same AI is also trying to cover, it, to cover gaps or uh, where this exists in the current advisory uh, services. And we will have this cross-sectoral component to be able to cover all the needs that uh, that uh, come through needs related to investment still okay thank you great thank you alina thank you martin thank you louise for also jumping in there so now i'll introduce um, our next presenter uh thierry van kumberg Kum hopefully nearly got that right so thierry is a policy advisor to the ministry minister of energy um in the Wallonie government in in belgium so um the European Investment Advisory Hub has been advising the Wallonie government uh, over recent months. So I, I will pass the phone out to Thierry, who will tell you a little bit more about that in some detail. So Thierry, over to you. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity for me to talk. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Thierry van Kohenberg, and then I am indeed working for a minister of energy in Wallonia. Wallonia is one of the three regions of Belgium. And the regions have a large autonomy, a large autonomy for the, to decide for this, themselves. And uh, this is why we can design strategies, we can mobilize budgets and create incentives as well as uh, legal constraints if needed. And therefore we have most of the needed tools in hand to prepare and to implement uh, a large uh, renovation plan for the all park, building park uh, of the region. Um, then you can pass the next slide. Uh, to tell you some about this plan, uh, we have subdivided the whole building stock to be renovated. Then uh, in average, the building stock uh, is uh, at the F level. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this operation, but the worst one is J. Uh, G, sorry, uh, and then uh, F is not that good. Uh, and we want to lift it up to uh, an average level of A. Then there is lots of uh, work to do, but it's also a chance for us because coming from quite low, if we can succeed to lift it up uh, to an A level in average, then we would uh, indeed uh, achieve a very good, uh, very good result. Um, the way we have to divide it, the, the wall uh, building stock is according to the way that the building owners will finance 
their work. Uh, and then we have divided that into, at first, the private dwellings. This is for the largest part of it, for 75%. And then the building, the, the public buildings for 15%. And this is quite easier because uh, when the government decides to go for uh, the renovation of the public buildings. Uh, well, the, the, he is the, the owner of uh, the building, and it's quite easy for him, for the, the government, to undertake the work. And the last part, the last, the remaining 10%, is for business-oriented buildings. And this is also not that difficult to go through, because um, uh, as soon as the price of not doing the work will be higher than the price of undertaking the, 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 the renovation work, then the private build, uh, business will go for it. That's a quite natural response. And then the challenge is to address the private dwellings, uh, because it amounts for one million dwellings, but it means also that we will have to address and to convince something like one million private owners. Then, please, the next slide, thank you. And then some time ago, it was, I believe, uh, a bit more than one year ago, EIB has undertaken a study for us. And this is a very good baseline because uh, government and teams passes, and we really need something that will that will not oblige us to go from scratch again with the next team and the next government. Then this is something that was already set uh, with the previous government. We will count on that one for this actual government, and we hope can be a green line to be followed by the next government. Um, of course, different priorities may need some adjustments, uh, but uh, uh, as a matter of fact, this kind of green lights is very helpful. Then for us, what is the most needed is that we need to structure the offer uh, in both ways, the, in quality, because uh, the result that we want to get is not the, um, the work itself, but the, the energy savings and uh, the, the energy efficiency in the buildings. Then if the work is done and paid for, but the result is not there, then very quickly um, people will know and they will run away from the renovation wave. Then we certainly want to ensure the quality of the work done. And uh, then that was in quality, but also in quantity, because uh, we need homes, we need people able to do the work, and uh, if we have a low 1% of natural rates of uh, renovation in the country, in, in the region, um, this keeps everybody busy, and this 1% keeps already everybody busy. And if you want to raise that 1% up to 3%, either we need more people, but we also need to be more efficient in the work that we are doing. Um, we need to structure uh, the offer, uh, uh, sorry, the offer I just said, but to stimulate the demand side too, uh, because if we stimulate the offer, we we'll need to provide the, to the offer enough needs uh, of work to be performed. Uh, and uh, for that, we also uh, need to, to level this, uh, this demand in order to not to have ups and downs uh, in the offer, uh, in the demand, sorry, but uh, something quite regular. And then fill the gap in rules and regulations, because we know that everything needs to be set and organized to, be, um, to avoid any, any misunderstanding between the, the, the different parties. Then the cornerstone of um, this challenge is the individual owner, because uh, we really believe this is the one we have to work on, and we have to simplify this renovation journey, including all financial aspects, because if you have 10 people in a room and you are speaking about one-stop shops, because this is all what it's about, uh, then at first you will believe that everybody speaks about the same thing, but you will quickly understand that you will have 10 different uh, definition to the one-stop shop. And for 
as far as I'm concerned, a one-stop shop is at the one place, the one uh, point of contact to which you, uh, with which you will start your renovation journey. From nothing up to everything is completed and everything is paid for too. The next uh, slide, please. But I think this is finished. This is the code that uh, I was asked to provide. And this is something personal. This is for me. Uh, it's very much more than a job, but more uh, kind of a mission. Because I'm not doing this because this is only some uh, a way to feed my family, but much more than that. It's really something I want to be part of because this is uh, tremendously important. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you for your passionate quote. It's good to hear such enthusiasm. Um, I just have one question for you, if you don't mind, around how, how do you ensure that the, the renovation wave in your region will be inclusive? How will you ensure that poorer households are also able to benefit? The low-income households mostly will be people renting their own place. Then we will uh be more effective in concentrating our efforts on the landlords and uh, convincing them to provide to the low income people uh, higher standards uh, place of for living uh, dwellings um, but of course we have some low income uh, families owning their own uh, their own place uh, and for them because we cannot Forget them, of course, because you have a correlation, a strong color, uh, correlation even, uh, between low income and also uh, the low efficiency in the building, in the dwelling. And then we will work on financial uh, support, but also on uh, fiscal support too. Great, right. so a complete package. So Thierry, I understand you have to, um, have to leave us, you have to go and brief your minister, which is an occupational hazard, no doubt, of your role. Uh, but if um, if participants do have questions for Thierry, you will try and make it back, I think, for the, the final Q&A. So please do put those questions on, on Slido and, uh, and we will try and pick them up later. So um, thank you very much, Thierry, for your participation, your presentation. Um, and I'd like to introduce my colleague who spoke a little bit earlier, uh, Louise White, who is Senior Engineer at EIB's Project Department. Um, Louise, you're going to talk a little bit more about Eleanor and then introduce uh, Lily, who will then talk a little bit about an example. So uh, I will pass the floor now to Louise. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, my job here today is relatively simple in that I am going to let Lily do most of the talking because um, uh, she is the project manager of a um, project called Capus Grid. Um, which currently has um, an Elena application. Um, so uh, as we've touched on earlier, the bank has a range of technical assistance and technical advisory facilities. Um, and Elena was set up in 2009, but what the hub support is allowing us to do is to spend more time at this application phase working directly with uh, beneficiaries so that we can develop a proposal that can get approved from uh, the European Commission for an Elena grant. And myself and Lily worked for quite a while on this particular application. Um, uh, and I think it's a good example of, of where that this support was very much needed because uh, needed and, and fruitful because in the end, thankfully, we did have an LNA contract that was signed. And now Lily is in the midst of all of this work to actually um, make this a, a realistic proposition. So, I mean, you'll, you'll see that it's quite complex and innovative from both a technical and organizational point of view. It's one municipality who is uh, working on behalf of a group of other municipalities and they're doing something very, very interesting in, in Hungary. So um, the Elena, as you can see on the slide here, I mean, the, the Elena facility itself, European Local Energy Assistance, um, it's essentially a program that the EAB and the European Commission uh, work together with. Um, the EAB manages it on behalf of the Commission. 
And what it does is it provides a grant for um, staff, existing staff or short-term experts uh, to help prepare a project. Um, and so um, Kappa's Grid is, I think, one of uh, the, the first smart grid type projects that we did. Um, it's, uh, it contains all of the elements of the types of programs that uh, Elena does. You can see under the purple there on that slide, renovation of buildings, lighting and uh, local infrastructure projects. So um, I'll leave the floor to Lily because I think it's always more interesting to hear from the projects on the ground and she can tell you a bit more about what this project is about and um, what it's doing right now. Thank you, Luis. Thank you very much for the possibility. Uh, I try to be as quick as possible. Um, uh, still understandable. So this is basically, an, we call it an urban energy project. As you can see on the slide, um, I called it this tale of six cities because uh, in itself the road to uh, the contract was uh, kind of like a tale, I think, sometimes. And it took a, a tremendous uh, work and cooperation uh, with the Elena team. Uh, and I can I can really say that this was not just helpful, but helped us um, to an extent that we could elaborate on the project more in more depth at a, at a feasibility study phase that we have uh, normally would do. So normally, uh, what were the even the, the project management issues and everything else we have uh, had to think over quite. Uh, earlier, much earlier than we have exactly started the project itself. Uh, and this was very helpful uh, for creating the setup, for example. Uh, as you can see, this uh, involves uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy resources, and all this incorporated uh, in a smart grid integration. And it's very important as uh, now today is the base, uh, basically the, the greatest problem of the, the energy sector, how to integrate the renewables without uh, creating uh, great uh, imbalances in the grid. And uh, this project aims to, to address this issue as well. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, you will see here a bit of a complex uh, slide. Uh, I try to show what the whole project is about. So we have the, the project uh, manager, project leader is Kaposvár and the uh, participating cities in Dunajváros, Szombathely, Tatapánya, Veszprém and Zalaegerszeg. These are all county seat uh, uh, cities of Hungary, uh, so uh, medium-sized large uh, cities we talk about. and. Um, uh, all of them will have uh, renewable energy resources, meaning uh, photovoltaic uh, installed. Uh, they will have uh, storage capacities and uh, also uh, energy efficiency investments uh, in uh, approximately 100 buildings. And also some cities ask for uh, smart public lighting systems to be installed as well. Um, you can see the structure on the top uh, uh, corner of the slide. So we will have a center site in um, Kaposvár where we will have this market center. Uh, there we will have a larger amount of storage. We will have the most uh, uh, PV installed here, and uh, these will be connected through the national grid to the other cities, and also via uh, telecommunication uh, means uh, to the smart uh, components of uh, of the local uh, sites. Uh, all local sites will also have a, a small um, sub uh, smart grid center, which basically will provide them uh, for a possibility to look at their, their own data and have uh, some of the analysis uh, done there as well. So this is the basin of the, the uh, structure, which is also interesting that um, putting together such a project, uh, technically speaking, is also a complex project, but it's even more complex to put it together um, um, speaking of organizations and speaking of the people uh, building up those organizations. And if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, this will uh, show uh, our models that we have uh, took out from uh, the, this uh, whole building phase, which was, uh, I think, three years, if I count it well, Luis, uh, altogether uh, by the time we got to the contract. So first is pre-planning and preparing. Uh, this is not just a play with the words, but it's really important that uh, uh, by the help of the Elena team, we had to go to such depth uh, in the uh, preparing of the project, which did, that would, you would normally uh, do at the starting of the project be before the kickoff uh, of the whole session. Um, 
but this was very useful because we had to think about uh, all the details uh, in in advance. And I really liked what Alina said about that uh, you like numbers, and uh, this also helped uh, a lot for us because we had to. Uh, not just uh, come up with ideas, but we had to put them into numbers and calculations uh, to an extent, which was also uh, really helpful. Um, the other thing is that we have realized that as, as we work with six different cities in six different locations, uh, we had to come up with a, a project management structure that would uh, work uh, effectively. And uh, in fact, uh, this uh, COVID kind of thing, this just helped us uh, in a way to make it more effective because we have already uh, started to work on, a, on an electronic office date, uh, base and we have created um, uh, a remote access data database, uh, which was the most effective. I can really recommend it to everyone. And it was really helpful. And we are now uh, all the cities managed to, to work with it. And, and, and all the materials can be found at a place that also us can reach and that also uh, we can uh, transport the flies with Luis quite easily. Um, and the next one is nothing works without building bridges between the team and also between the leaders. It was also a moral of the story that uh, although we had the politicians uh, decided the whole thing, but we needed the local people to be motivated and to, to understand what the whole uh, story is about. And it was really important to, to, to build up those connections and those uh, um, uh, parts the, where, where all, the, all the local staff was uh, deeply uh, motivated, understood what this whole project means. And this also helped uh, because uh, we had the change uh, of the leadership in three cities during uh, last year, uh, during the uh, the project, and it we had a very smooth transition because of this, because the local people who were effectively working on the field were very much uh, in the project, and they could uh, um, inform the new leaders well enough so that there was not really any problem with that. And this also requires a continuous communication and the, and then all the time education and involvement of the new project members because it's uh, um, unavoidable that sometimes the project members uh, change as well. Next slide, please. I was also asked for a quote, and um, that was like this that vision, motivation, and motivating are the pillars of the bridge of overcoming the valleys of the project that ends <laughs> mainly uh, if you manage to find the key and uh, and the, the connection and the bridges between the people, uh, both leaders and the technicians and the technical partners, then you can get through the problematic points of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philly. Thank you, Louise. Um, question for you, Louise, if I may. How, how easy or difficult would you say it is for a smaller town to access the, the type of support that Lily has just outlined here in this example? Um, well, in theory, anyone can apply for Elena, any private or public body. But I think that um, it's not going to be suitable for, uh, say, what we call say smaller projects, because we do have a requirement in Elena that every million euro of grant has to support um, between 10 and 20 million euro of investment on the ground. So um, if you were a city that was doing um, a project for five or six million or this Elena isn't the, isn't the isn't the facility for you. Um, and actually, I was at a webinar this morning this morning where we were talking about the European Union city facility, which is now giving 60,000 grant uh, to to local authorities or to um, municipalities to prepare uh, projects. And also you have the EASME, which provides project development assistance, another European Commission initiative, which helps um, the same types of areas of, of Elena. But um, having that said, we do see a lot of smaller cities or municipalities coming together um, in groups. And I think that that's why CAP as far as uh, such a, or CAP as great, it's such a good um, example of this because individually each of these would not have been um, of the scale required to 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 apply for Elena, but together um, they, they were able to do this. And this also has um, benefits for their project as a whole because it's, um, it's a regional program with lots of different parties involved. 
And I will say just on a, on a, as a personal on a personal level, when we went to the kickoff meeting, I mean, for Elena, I would normally be in the room with maybe two or three other people. And for the one in Capas Far, I mean, Lily, I don't know exactly how many people were there, but it was about 50 people. And you could see each municipality had its own team. And what really impressed me actually was how each, each municipality was very much focused on its own area and they were very, very clear on what their objectives were and what they wanted to do. And, you know, that's not an easy thing. I mean, if you've all been involved in projects, you know, trying to coordinate that many people is actually quite a, a difficult task. So it's interesting what you were saying about how you're now set up for the COVID because actually the structure you have in place is you're probably one of the few people who are perfectly set up for this at the moment, which is which is nice. <laughs> yes, that's right. right. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, I think we're now supposed to go to um, another Slido poll. So a Slido poll should appear on our screens, the third poll. Here we go. Great, it works. So at what stage of the project life cycle do you see uh, the biggest advisory needs? So it's a slightly nuanced question on the earlier one, uh, trying to get into a bit more detail in terms of where, where do we see the biggest needs? So if participants can please, please vote. Is it working? <laughs> it doesn't appear like we're receiving any votes, so I don't know if the poll is, is live. I'll try and have a go on my phone. Ah, yes, there we go. So project preparation. Feasibility. Okay, Lily, could I maybe ask you to give us a little bit of a reflection on on those results? Does that do those results align with with your experience in terms of where the biggest needs are? Yes, um, my my view is that project preparation is the first, and also the feasibility is the second. So as I said, we had to do a pre feasibility study, and it was very really, really helpful to go through the details and even like. Uh, uh, for example, we had hours of discussions with Luis on how to calculate, for example, the certain indicators that uh, we have to comply with and, and uh, how this special kind of project uh, approach can um, be suitable for that. So, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. I agree with and policy and strategy is also scored quite, quite highly, which is, which is good. Interesting to see tendering has only got uh, three percent. We often hear public authorities having difficulties with navigating public procurement procedures. So, uh, interesting to see that only three percent voted in that direction. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your votes. Uh, we have another poll now on Slido. So, if we can please launch poll four. So this one is uh, in respect of the support that should be available under the recovery plan for Europe. So um, participants who are interested in your views, where where do you see the support being focused moving forwards, scaling up existing advisory services, integrating advisory services into additional financing? So that's really um, further elaborating on this, this one-stop shop approach that we've been talking about where a recipient would be able to go to one place to to an intermediary to a an energy agency and secure the grant advisory and financing support they needed or establishing new advisory services and so far we have a clear winner on on integration which which is good to see that's in line with our ideas i think as well in relation to how we can embed um, advisory support within financial instruments and investment platforms Great, we'll just give that another second, see if there are any further votes to come in. And then we will go to the uh, questions that you have kindly put on the Slido. 
Great. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so let's have a look at these. So question number one, we seem to be stuck on the renovation of buildings. There are other sectors where renovation makes a lot of sense, such as community goods and consumer goods and transport. Is advisory support um, in energy efficiency available in other sectors? The short answer is, is yes, it is. Sorry, we have focused on, on buildings today, but um, the hub can support uh, all, all types of energy efficiency. Uh, we have examples of support that's been provided to help SMEs to help uh, transport. There's there's an Eleanor program, I think, for, for uh, yeah. I was just route. going to maybe make the point that um, yeah, we were focusing more on on the buildings today, but um, Eleanor actually supports uh, preparation grants for sustainable um, and innovative transport solutions as well. So there are a number of programs um, in it's it's a different team, so that's why I wasn't discussing it uh, today. But um, it's it's dealing a lot with um, providing grants to public bodies who are doing very interesting things actually in, in transport. Um, so I think for cities as a whole, there's a there's a huge body of work that's going on there. So while we may have been discussing um, the buildings element, for, for, for sure, transport is also a very important part of the whole Elena program. And I'm sure there, there, there's also other examples of other sectors that's being that are being supported by by the hub, which you can actually there's a lot of stories, I think, on the website, which give some practical examples of that. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, okay, this maybe is a is one for you as well, Louise. Has the Eleanor Savings identica identification stage helped in finding potential project partners? Maybe that's on for Lily as well. Um, I, I, I I don't fully understand the question, but I mean, just to be clear, if you have an Eleanor program with the European Investment Bank, there's only one other beneficiary so there's just there's there's a there's a contract there between one person or one one body but in most cases there are um, other partners that are involved in that be it um, uh, you know a, a financial body and a technical body in in, in collaboration or, or some other structure um, and because the Elena program requires you to meet this leverage factor you have to have some idea of how your project is going to be um, financed and how you're going to do it um, however as part of that uh, three, four year period where you get the Elena support you can use it to try to find um, to make that more concrete so you know do do the financial applications or business plans that financial uh, bodies are requiring in order to provide the fi financing i don't know if that's what they mean by a project partner as such but um you will also as an elena beneficiary be hiring other partners or other stakeholders to do the work on the ground and in, in certain cases they're also seen as, as as partners to the project um so yeah Elena itself isn't looking for helping you find your partners but it's giving you the resources to 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 you know to fund all of those elements that that are required maybe if if, if there was more clarification they could ask the question yeah. okay thank you Louise. Lily did you want to come in on that one uh, yeah, just uh, I just wanted to add that yes, definitely. This, uh, this uh, preparation phase uh, with the Elena team enormously helped us to to clarify those project partners that will be involved uh, in the end. And this was uh, the time for us to 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 work on the consortium agreement, which is a really important part of this whole project now. Thank you. Uh, the next question, can the advisory hub incentivize commercial banks to invest more into climate action? Uh, I have thoughts on that, but Martin, do you have any uh, comments you'd like to make in terms of how can we encourage financial intermediaries to invest more, to participate more in the, in the climate action space? Uh, I mean, uh... It's very difficult. <laughs> I think this is this is actually very difficult. But uh, uh, if if you combine uh, some sort of technical assistance with uh, with the specific product, uh, I have to say that this is something that is a traditional uh, uh, traditional area of expertise of the EBRD. That's how they usually. They, they usually combine a grant uh, element, uh, which is an incentive, and also a technical assistance component, 
together with the uh, financing. And uh, th this is how uh, they actually roll out uh, this type of programs. But it's, uh, it's fairly complicated, uh, I have to say. Yeah, I think that the PFR model is also, um, is also oh, a good example. Going to add on that. Yeah. yeah, because on, um, I mean, it's, it's the private finance for energy efficiency is one of those such programs where a bank gets uh, three elements. It gets the guarantee from um, the European Investment Bank. It also gets the financing uh, to on lend at the terms and conditions, which should you know be longer tenors and lower interest rates and it also there's this central technical assistance facility whereby the banks can access consultants to do some training for their staff or to update their processes so i think that um to get the commercial banks more interested in climate action you have to recognize that a lot of them um, need to be offered some incentives and also some 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 training. So there are definitely programs in place, but I think more needs to be done to try to increase the uptake of that because it's also still a process for them to apply. And then, yeah, the, you, 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 from what I've seen, you need to have one or two people in the banks that are really pushing this so that they that they get more involved. It's something we're also trying to pilot from a. The financial instrument perspective, we have a, a pilot in Malta. Yeah. We have oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. a guarantee funded by and supported by ESIF, and we have an interest rate subsidy, so a, a grant, and then we also have a, a, a financial intermediary support package, so a web tool to help the banks calculate energy savings, and also um, some local consultants who can help uh, the banks navigate the energy saving calculations of, of non-standard projects. So I think it's definitely an area we're looking to, to build on in the future. I think it's completely right if we're going to make make any head headway in this area, we're going to have to try and bring more banks to the table and, and, and make it more hospitable for them to, to increase their their level of activity in this area. Um, there is a, a question about a project which I'm afraid I'm not familiar with, the East Med project. Um, so that might be one we may have to take offline i'm afraid um and there is also a, a question so does advisory delivered by big international banks not advantage big international consulting consultancies so how can local consultants gain from these services um okay any any, any takers for the for this final question um alina you mentioned earlier about work the hub is doing to try and empower mpbs and deliver more local advisory capacity Louise, we've spoken about the Eleanor model, and, and Lily, you are you are living and breathing. I think this, this example. So I don't know. I invite um, all three of you to, to to share a comment with us, if you may. I may start if uh, if it's okay with you. So um, I'm not sure we favour uh, the big international consultancies because, as I said, the through the InvestEU Advisory Hub, we will have advisory partners that can be either IFIs, so international financial institutions, or NPBs. But uh, this does not necessarily mean that uh, we'll work with uh, big international consultancies. So we we can work with uh, what we call external service providers, including these international consultancies, but this will be for very small uh, advisory initiatives. And uh, what is important maybe to understand is the the model that can be used by our advisory partners. So the advisory support can be delivered either directly by the advisory partner through their staff, or indirectly by procuring um, advisory or so procuring consultancy services at local level. And this is exactly where the local consultants have a very big role to play. So then the, I think somebody already mentioned, this is how Martin uh, mentioned, this is how EBRD works. They bring in the, the local consultants actually uh, to support the SMEs uh, now in what we have uh, a project under the AI in uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, and Greece. So uh, it's exactly the opposite that we are doing. We are actually trying to encourage the use of the local consultants as much as, as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's really just to add um, what Alina said. Um, just on a practical level, we have had some projects which have wanted us to 
do the tendering ourselves in the bank. Um, but in the Elena model in particular, what we want to see is local consultants with the local knowledge and local expertise getting involved. So actually, when you when a beneficiary gets the Elena grant, um, it's very it's, it's completely their responsibility. I mean, following the right procurement rules and, and, and regulations to to tender out so that local um, local bodies can be can apply. And in some cases, you don't need the tender procedure. You know, you can have the direct award for the smaller contracting. So this again, um, the local consultants can be involved as involved as the structure allows. Sometimes you you require a bigger co tender contract and sometimes um, you can have the smaller ones, but it very much depends on the project and it's really up to the beneficiary at the local level. So that whole international um, big international contract that you might associate with the bank, it doesn't really apply in the Elena case, at least because you're talking about grants of a few million. And so that's the money that they have to spend over the course of, of the three year period. Um, just another point, just to mention quickly on a previous point on the commercial banks, um, we do also have banks that have applied uh, for, for Elena now as well, because there's a big focus, particularly for SMEs and for um, residential customers to try to retrofit their buildings. And um, the, the banks are applying for Elena so that they can provide energy audits to their clientele and use that as, um, as a way of getting those individual assessments done. Um, and then the bank itself can, can use that to give loans to its clients. So, I mean, while I won't say that it's it, it's doing it everywhere, I, I think that we were, every year we're seeing more and more of these, of these contracts in place. And if you go on the EIB website, you'll be able to see a lot of these projects from financial institutions who, who are doing these things. And again, it's it's a little bit like that one-stop shop. It's not a technical one-stop shop, but at the same time, it's a way where a beneficiary can go to the one the one entity, in this case, a financial institution, and get its financing and get some advice on, on the technical aspects as well. So I think this one-stop shop concept is, is indeed very wide, and it'll take many shapes and forms depending on, on the, the types of projects and, and, and the areas um, uh, and, and what is what will work in, in, in different sectors. Thank you, Louise. Lily, any, any very quick reflections from your perspective as a as a local consultant? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add uh, basically what Louise said that um, yes, this is although this is an EIB project in in a way, but this is a local project. So uh, basically, uh, local people know what has to be done at the local level, and um, if we also. Uh, as I said earlier, it's just that not just that the consultancy matters, but it also matters the people at, uh, at the really at the front line who are really doing the work and uh, at the municipalities. So it's very important. It was very important for us to find those local people that have the knowledge, have the uh, um, network base, basically, that they can, for example, they just know the, the principal of the school and they can call them even if it's summertime that oh, can, can we go into the building can we look at the roof and so on so things like that you really need to involve the locals and you cannot do it really from uh, upside somewhere else great thank you so we're coming to the end of, of our session uh, now we have a slido uh, word cloud to to finish with um which should appear on the screen we have the East Med question again, which we'll need to take offline, I'm afraid, because we don't have the answer. So, word cloud. So, what is your impression or experience with the European Advisory Hub? Um, so, please type away. Let's let's see what that word cloud looks like. And whilst you're doing that, I'll just remind you that, as you probably know from from the other sessions, and um, the organisers of the event have invited us to make a, a final poll, poll as, as part of all of the sessions. Um, and I, I really hope that through the through the presentations and the discussion and the, the Q&A this afternoon, we've we've managed to, um, oh, supportive, thanks, that's a good one. We've managed to give you a good flavor of the, the nature and the type of support that's available under the advisory hub and also some uh, of the future Future orientations and direction under under Investor U Advisory Hub complex. Okay, not not so good one, but not easy to access. 
Interesting, okay. Not easy to access is an interesting one. Um, and the extent to which that's about the actual access, because the access is remarkably easy. There is a there's a website, and there's a request form, there's a wizard. But I think the issue maybe is about awareness and how how the availability of the advisory hub support is has been marketed and communicated. It may be that people just aren't fully aware of, of what supports out there. A bit much financial. Okay, great. Okay, well, um, we're coming towards the end end of the session, so um, I'd like to thank our presenters, our speakers, very much for your, your interventions and for answering the questions. I'd like to thank you all um, for your attention on what, if it's anything like it is here where I am, a very hot, sunny afternoon. So thank you for, for being inside and bearing with us and uh, I wish you all a, a very nice evening. Um, and thanks again for showing your interest in the advisory hub. And please do check out the, the advisory hub website for further information. And if you have any ideas of, of support that um, that you may think we may be able to help you with, please do get in touch. We would be delighted to hear from you and to help you with your projects. So um, thank you very much, everybody. I'll, I'll say goodbye and um, I'll end the session. Thanks again. Thank you.